Thank you so much. Um, I think Ryan still needs to be promoted. Um, I'm going to launch into the presentation, but Ryan's definitely going to be supporting me in the Q&A. Thank you. All right, everyone. So thank you. So this is um, category theory for semantic data interoperability. And uh, we see uh, significant uh, implications to being able to exchange and consolidate data for agile product lifecycle management, especially at large scales. Um, and so first, you know, the context being, we're talking about a very large number of and variety of systems uh, with a diverse set of perspectives on what the data means um, and undergoing continuous change. So think many applications that are being used to uh, you know, develop a, a product, it could be a power station, it could be an aircraft, it could be a car, uh, it could even be a building. Um, and these applications are changing the way that they shape the data, the structure of the data through new versions. Um, there's also standards to adhere to and to reconcile with um, and, uh, and, and then a desire to keep them all integrated. And so thinking of one specific example, um, the manufacturing and design of an aircraft, we can uh, imagine it starts with things like requirements and there will be test cases and of course designs and simulations. There'll be a manufacturing process that needs to be planned for. There'll be things like control system logic and, and of course the supply chain bills of material um, and, and whatnot. And this is of course just a subset of the perspectives that can go into something like this. And it's also not respective of how complex these individual uh, perspectives are, because if we zoom into something just like design, we can see that there are many different applications involved in the design process. Uh, and uh, they don't always talk to each other seamlessly. I mean, these are all CAD tools. And one might assume because they're all CAD tools, they surely can interoperate because they all follow the CAD standard. Um, but anyone has in practice has realized that that doesn't always, it's not always the case. And there can be all sorts of other meaning that's hanging off of a CAD standard that uh, each individual vendor has uh, developed on their own uh, in, in an effort to service their customers, uh, implementing new features. And that standard uh, hasn't kept up with the, the new sort of uh, concepts that have been incorporated. Um, but we can think of each of these things as a data source. And um, you know, with the assumption that the data is made accessible, it's is it being exposed in some way, either through an API or a direct connection to an underlying database, um, there's some way to access the data. And uh, in each case, there's some sort of a structure, like a semantic structure. You can think of it as a schema or a data model, uh, but it's a, it's, you can think of it as buckets of data and relationships to each other, like the uh, relationships between the buckets, and then rules or constraints on how uh, that, that uh, like what sort of shape that has to adhere to. And if there's a desire to be able to exchange data from one application to another or one system to another, and this you know, could be an application like a CAD tool, it could be a spreadsheet, um, it could be you know, some custom application, it could be a large sophisticated application, it could be any of these things that we've mentioned to, so far. If there's a desire to be able to exchange data between these systems or consolidate it, uh, there's a need to actually extract and then transform and then load the data or um, you know, export, modify, import, uh, you know, there's a, a, the data actually has to move and often change when going from one application to the other, of course. And if we imagine uh, two applications and a desire to exchange the data between them, we need essentially two integrations, one going each way. Uh, and uh, if we were, to, the, the challenge though, is that when we have a third application, now we need six integrations. And when we have a fourth application, we need 12. And when we have a fifth, we need 20 and very quickly this just becomes infeasible and doesn't really make any sense and so very rarely does anyone really try to do this and if they ever sort of make an attempt in this direction it's uh you know some subset and uh of course there's this additional challenge of change so if an application changes uh while you know these integrations are being built it throws into question all of the integrations from that application out and it it could be that those integrations are broken um, and they're they're no, like they're going to corrupt data, or they're just not going to work. They're not going to transmit the data that they're supposed to. Uh, but in many cases, like it's kind of an unknown. Like it's difficult to test for, uh, especially every possible case of of what the data shape could be, and um, and so it just represents friction and, uh, and and challenges for the organization. And the relationship here at play is roughly n squared. It's quadratic in nature, so n being the number of applications. Um, it's not exactly n squared, but it's approximately n squared, but the cost curve looks something like this. And so any company that has attempted to do 
uh, some sort of interoperability has you know probably evaluated this as a path if not having started down it in practice and realized very quickly that it's just infeasible and it won't actually be uh, possible with the company's resources and so to try to work around that challenge uh you know first of all the company may pick and choose the most strategically important uh, integrations. Uh, so rather than trying to integrate everything to everything, they'll just, you know, integrate a couple systems to each other and leave it at that. that. Um, but in, effort, in an effort to drive interoperability or, or exchange data at a larger scale, they, of course, set standards, uh, CAD standards, for instance. But there's many other examples of things like ontologies that I'm sure most people here are familiar with. And uh, this can simplify the problem, at, you know, at one, from one perspective, and that there's far fewer lines. Now we just need relationships from each application to the standard, and, uh, and, and that can sort of reduce the, the quadratic explosion of work that has to take place. Um, but the problem with this is that when you're trying to standardize, in, in some narrow concepts or contexts, standardization makes a lot of sense. Uh, you're standardizing things like uh, how to authenticate into application. There's a very narrow set of, of semantics, you know, a, 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 a authentication token, you know, user ID, a password, you know, things like this. Um, but if you're trying to standardize all possible meaning across like a diverse set of domains, there's going to be these challenges with the subtleties of what things mean in, in from one perspective to another, or whether or not they've even been considered. And so one example when uh, constructing an aircraft is uh, tolerance stacking. And so basically it has to do with, um, first of all, we can imagine this application here is let's say an application designed to organize and, and manage how parts are joined together. And this application here is is designed to uh, or is used to design the actual parts. And so we have this issue of um, drilling holes in parts of the fuselage of the aircraft to fasten them together, and uh, the holes not lining up. And this is a result of of the vibration uh, and the size of the drill bit, the thickness of the material, whether or not there was a hole or pilot holes drilled beforehand, and the order in which the holes were drilled. And so there's these very specific concepts, and particularly pertaining to vibration, because the order in which the holes are drilled has a lot to do with how you manage that vibration of that process. And so there's this, this concept of vibration that's very important to this edge case in these domains that uh, it, it likely wouldn't be incorporated into the standard because it's something that's kind of niche and this just only pertains to these two applications or maybe one or two others, but doesn't really pertain to everything. Um, and further, when we think about all of the various perspectives that go into this, there's like this compounding problem of these different perspectives not agreeing to what things mean. And so hypothetically, we can imagine that uh, the uh, teams working on the landing gear of the aircraft would have a particular uh, a notion of vibration relative to how the wheels interact with the runway and the team designing the overall shape of the aircraft. Uh, the exterior shape as a body of the whole, you know, concerning themselves with vibration relative to things like air friction. And so uh, these nuanced differences of what things mean cause bottlenecks uh, in the deciding of how do we standardize this stuff and ultimately, you know, will have leave to information loss if, if there is, uh, they try to generalize and which is often the case and so basically trying to standardize semantics globally will inevitably sacrifice this domain specific semantic fidelity um and so you have that you're either sacrificing whole integrations or you're sacrificing um you know uh, portions of all the integrations where they don't uh, there isn't a common under uh, common understanding of what that means uh, and this is quite the conundrum and most, if essentially all the companies we're aware of, uh, are stuck at this uh, this this challenge um, related to data interoperability. Um, and so that is where we come in. And uh, just like a bit of brief background here, so the the innovation here is actually in mathematics. It's in categorical mathematics, and categorical mathematics or category theory has been developed for uh, uh, over 100 years. So the, the mathematics itself is, is, is quite uh, mature and robust, but the it was around uh, 2011 uh, when there was this discovery made that how, how it relates to data structures and data schemas and how all of these um, mathematical tools can be applied to that. And then for the last 10 years, that's been developed further and further uh, and deployed at companies like Uber and, and more recently, uh, a lot of uh, sort of uh, focus on engineering domains and enab enabling interoperability in, in uh, engineering systems where uh, provable correctness, you know, machine verification is important. 
um, that the two that are, are centrally responsible or, or to thank for that uh, that uh, transfer from mathematics to data or uh, data structures is uh, David Spivak and Ryan Wisniewski. Uh, Ryan is on the call here with us today. He'll he'll be uh, fielding any uh, difficult technical questions. And uh, why you should care is is because of this. Uh, so if we imagine um, the building complete integrations, not having to sacrifice uh, you know that that was those edge domain semantics. So this this cost curve here will essentially with to get the same outcome, we have a, a, a less a, uh, a much more manageable cost curve. It's basically a linear base with about a bit of diminishing returns uh, thanks to things like machine learning. So um, how does that work? Because that's a pretty bold claim. So it has to do with composition, compositionality. And uh, if we imagine like we were before, we have these two systems um, and we're wanting to exchange data, data back and forth, uh, building a bi-directional integration is going to be a, a similar amount of work uh, with this technology. Uh, it's slightly less work with this technology in that some of the um, meaning that needs to be translated can be done bi-directionally. So you only have to define it once. Certain things like string reformatting and, and whatnot, uh, in many cases, will need to be uh, hand coded both ways. So, to, you know, we'll assume for, you know, just to keep it simple, uh, two integrations or two applications, two integrations, same amount of work. But where things get interesting is as it scales. When we incorporate the third application, we still need to build these four integrations, like you see in these lines here, but we get the, these for free, basically uh, by composition. So we build four integrations, we get six. As we add a, a fourth application, we have to build six integrations, but we get 12. When we add a fifth application, we have to build eight integrations, but we get 20. And of course, this scales very nicely. When we have, see all 11 of these applications on the screen, we have to build 22, but we get 220. And of course, not now not every case, you're going to need every single application to be able to communicate with every other application. Um, there's often some subset of this, but the thing is that sub we found that, sub sub that subset can change over time. It's difficult to predict. And even at any even time, it's unlikely that the organization even knows what subset is important or not. And so having the capability for any application to in, uh, interoperate with any other application, when they share, when, when they both are housing data that have some semantic overlap, like in other words, they both have some data that means the same thing, uh, then uh, this is obviously quite helpful. And uh, it's uh, the value is actually further compounded when you consider change. So when an application it changes its semantic structure. So again, like we're talking about a schema change or a data model change from a new version of an application, not simply data itself changing. Um, we can uh, compose that integration or that mapping as well. So we essentially map uh, the new version of the application to the old one. And then all of the integrations into the old version will now work with the new one. And if there's like a new concept that's been introduced that needs to be incorporated, we can uh, you know add that on. So essentially, uh, you know, it allows for a, a, a much, you don't have to rebuild the integration or, uh, across all of them. Furthermore, because of the way that these integrations work, they're, they're actually being uh, built sort of in a mathematical language. It's a declarative language, but it's one that's built directly from category theory. Um, everything is machine verifiable. Uh, and in the sense that you can uh, ensure that it won't uh, degrade the integrity of data. You're not going to corrupt data. You're not going to accidentally delete data. And in any case where, uh, let's say, you know, hypothetically, one of these lines didn't have a green check mark on it, and you know, it was essentially there was a detected problem. Uh, we can actually quantify exactly what that uh, data loss would be or that information loss would be. And so it's deterministic, and it can uh, do these checks. Uh, uh, it can it can do the integrity check at compile time. Uh, in order to measure the information loss, we would have to do what we call round trip, where we pass data from system A to system B and then back to system A, and then we measure exactly what information was lost. Um, and if we think back to you know the sort of these many diverse perspectives, you know often it's not simply a matter of wanting to exchange data between applications. Um, it has to do with consolidating data. You know if you wanted to ask a, like what if analysis, like what, what if we change this requirement, like how is that going to impact? You know our designs how is that can impact our supply chain and our manufacturing process or if we swap out a supplier and this part is different how is that going to impact our requirements or our simulations which simulations will we need to run again what designs do we need to change you know these asking these questions 
um, you know, across many diverse perspectives, you know, right now requires a lot of emailing and conversations and things. And so to be able to do this in a more deterministic, more automated fashion, there needs to be consolidation. Uh, so not just links linking all the applications, but a way to uh, uh, consolidate all of those information models and all the data along with them to be able to ask these questions in a way that uh, the answers can be trusted. And so if we imagine, um, you know, two applications can have very different uh, data structures, we can have like a relational uh, structure in one application and maybe uh, something a little more, uh, you know, semi structured or, or hierarchical or something like that, like XML or JSON in another application, or simply an applications API. Uh, no matter the structure of the data, it can be modeled in category theory, category theory effectively subsumes all possible data structures. And so when we import any structure into category theory, it now gives us um, something to get traction on and, and, you know, so this categorical model of sorts that incorporates like all the constraints the rules the relationships the meaning of things and uh and then in this model we can uh relate meaning so we can say you know this over here is the same as this over here or or you know maybe with this particular transformation in it uh and we can do these mappings and then we can compute a consolidated uh information model so we can uh you, there's no need for an architect to try to come up with like what's a generalized model that subsumes these three systems or what's like the master information model or master data model that we want to use uh this is actually computes it automatically so it's like a bottom-up way of, of of designing a, a universal model or a master model and furthermore it can be it can be applied to the actual data and this is why we have gotten so excited about oslc because uh, these links uh, are, are, are can be incorporated into this and actually used to consolidate. So if you imagine you have two systems and there has been some work done to map the schemas to each other and then and, and there's a bunch of links to link the actual records themselves, uh, we can take these things as inputs. And uh, so basically we need the data schema, we need the data records, we need schema links, record links, and then rules. It could be linking rules, it could be data governance rules. Um, basically think of it as, as constraints on the data. Uh, with these things as an input, we can consolidate the data uh, and uh, continuously and iteratively or incrementally keep consolidating the data up from the sources. So we can imagine you know, multiple sources being consolidated up into a, a domain model or a domain data product, let's say, um, for any, any data mesh uh, fans. We can think of um, you know cross domain links being built and then the multiple domains being consolidated into like cross domain models and everything just keep getting composed up until you have some sort of a universal model um, that res actually respects the nuances and integrity of all of the sources. Um, and so to reiterate, I apologize for this slide full of text, but uh, just, just to serve as a review, we can uh, automate the composition of integration so basically what that means is uh, uh you get you put in a linear amount of work and you get a quadratic amount of integrations out um we can merge data models schemas and even ontologies safely um we can exchange and consolidate data between these systems we can uh, enable forward and backward compatibility uh adapting to change much easier when 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 uh applications change their information structures we can curate and add sources incrementally so we don't have to um you know there doesn't have to be this tremendous effort to figure out like how do we generalize across these five systems and then once we try to add a sixth system now we have to rethink that whole thing i mean we do but the computer does it and it does it very fast and so you can just keep adding stuff to it and and uh and it'll just keep recomputing what the universal model should be um, we can enforce global and domain specific rules. And so, you know, you can think of this as it pertains to things like data governance, but it also in terms of uh, a practice, frankly, that's not very common yet, but we expect will be become much more common in the future where um, the subject matter experts of a particular system or, ed or domain who understand the data really well uh, have, uh, you know, there are, there's sensibilities that could be applied to the data to ensure that it isn't misunderstood or misused. So like constraints on the, on the shape of it, on the structure of it that are, aren't expressible in things like SQL, they can be expressed in this language and then enforced through transformations. Um, I know it's a bit abstract, be happy to talk about more, uh, some more about that. Uh, machine verify, we can also machine verify the integrity of the integrations and the information models, you know, ensuring that the consolidated model hasn't corrupted anything, hasn't degraded the integrity, that the composed integrations aren't going to corrupt data and degrade their integrity. 
we can quantify um, the implications of imperfect integration. So if if there is a detection of hey, there's um, some uh, contradiction here, or there you know there's a, a, a mismatch. Um, that uh, we can do what we call the round trip that I mentioned before, where we pass data from one system to the other and then back to the original system and measure what what was the information loss. And we can interoperate between any kind of data structure. So if you wanted to uh, merge an ontology with a database with another system that was uh, just had an API emitting JSON, uh, that that uh, is, is what this is good at. So. Um, and the way we think of this is that there is what we, you know, we would imagine is like a semantic fabric. Uh, you can think of it as like a data model fabric or a schema fabric, but it's like a fabric of meaning that's running through all, every organization and it pertains to people and in the systems. And it's formalized in some particular cases where you have something like a database with an explicit structure or even a spreadsheet. Um, but uh, the translation between that and, and the other domains or the other perspectives uh, is informal and it's done, you know, often through email and conversations, maybe in the case, occasionally there'll be a spreadsheet, um, can be also in things like Word documents, I think you get the idea. And uh, the benefit of formalizing this semantic structure is that uh, if it's formal, you can check things really fast. And if you can check things fast, you can change them fast with more confidence. And uh, if it's formal, you can machine verify it, hence the confidence and the trustworthiness of not only the relationships, but also their ability to change them or evolve them over time. And uh, if when it's formal, you can also compose them. And if you can compose them, you can basically build this fabric, this formal fabric, much faster. Um, and so that's what we do. That's uh, the, the innovation. And